Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Charlotte de Guigné. I'm a labor law manager at Orcom HCP. And I'm here with you today with my colleague, Roxane Kouzou, who, mm -hmm. will, uh, who is also a labor law lawyer and who works with me. And today we are pleased to organize that webinar in English uh, for you, and we hope that you'll enjoy it. Um, as trying to understand French law uh, can be overwhelming, and we understand that the work duration topic in particular can be challenging uh, for foreign companies. So today our goal is to present you the main types of work duration in France and explain to you how it works and clarify your understanding. So let's start with the presentation. So today um, we want to focus on the following topics. So first work duration rules, then the notion of working time, which is very important to understand, working time flat rate pay arrangement, part-time contracts, monitoring work duration, and uh, the question of work duration um, with mobility. And at the end of our presentation, you'll be able to ask your question via the chat, and we'll be ha happy to answer. So now let's start with presenting you the French basic work duration rules. So, today's work duration uh, rules started with Aubrey Lowe's first and second um, that was published in 1998 and year 2000, and it fixed the basis of work duration regulation in France. So, from those laws, um, the collective legal work duration decreased to 35 hours per week. As a consequence, work duration under 35 hours per week is considered as part-time work duration or part-time contracts. Contracts indicating a work duration equal to 35 hours per week are considered as full-time contracts and any hours performed over 35 hours per week is considered as overtime. So this rule is very basic and it's very understand to have that in mind for all the rest of our presentation because this is the very principle of work duration in France. With that in mind, uh, we'll now focus on the maximum work durations you have a maximum daily working time and a maximum weekly working time. So the maximum daily working time in France is 10 hours per day. So this is the maximum work duration you can have for an employee per day. Also, you have to combine that working time with the maximum weekly working time, which is 48 hours per week with an average of 44 hours per week over a period of 12 weeks. Um, regarding the daily working time, if the time of work reaches six hours, then you have to keep in mind that the employee benefits from a 20 minutes break, um, and it's important to plan that, this. If you don't respect those maximum work duration, the company can be summoned to a fine of 750 euros per employee, and the labor inspector can sentence the company with a warning or a fine of 5,000 euros per employee, or 8,000 euros per employee in case of recidivism. So this will be um, in the case of the labor inspectorate has already sentenced you or has already um, see that in the company those mandatory uh, work duration maximums were not respected and so that um, the company can be sentenced to uh, this superior fine of, uh, of eight sorry thousand euros. 
also there are mandatory resting periods. The minimum daily resting time here is 11 consecutive hours per day. And the minimum weekly resting time is 24 consecutive hours per week. Um, so, regarding this minimum weekly resting time, uh, the consequence is that an employee can work at maximum, well, a maximum of six days per week. Regarding overtime, at the very beginning of that presentation, I told you that the legal work duration in France was 35 hours per week. So work duration is counted in weeks and overtime is counted over the week. It's not allowed to compensate overtime from a week to another, except if the company applies a company agreement or a CBA, a collective bargaining agreement, organizing work duration within a larger frame than the week. And it's also important to know that unless your CBA or the company agreement provides otherwise, the week starts on Monday at midnight and ends at um, midnight, but 12 p.m. on Sunday. This is how we, we consider the week to uh, count over time. Unless the, the company's CBA or company agreements provides otherwise, labor, co labor code rules apply. So, over time has to be compensated. And regarding French labor code, uh, from the 36th hour to the 43rd hour, um, over time is compensated in salary with an increased rate of 25% per hour. And from the 44th hour, the compensation is also in salary with an increased rate of 50% uh, per hour. It's also important to, to, to know that the company uh, can sign a company agreement in order to negotiate a compensation in rest instead of payment or to, to reduce also the rate. But you'll have to keep in mind that this rate will never be inferior to 10%. This is mandatory. Also, French Labour Code indicates a maximum limit of overtime, which is called annual overtime quota, which we call contingent in French. And annual overtime quota is set up by the company's CBA or by the collective agreement that may define the number of hours composing the quota, or lay down all the conditions for the performance of overtime beyond that quota. If you don't have uh, any information on that regard, well, in your CBA, or if your company hasn't negotiated any collective agreement on that topic, uh, it will be the French Labour Code that will apply, and the maximum, um, annual overtime quota will be 220 hours per annum and per employee. Here you have a table of um, four different CBAs um, and uh, we indicated uh, the maximum um, overtime yearly overtime quota for every CBA and you can see that depending on the company's activity and depending on the type of staff you can have different um, sailing. Uh, for example for Santec you have uh, 130 hours quota for ETAM and 220 uh, hours quota for engineers and managers. Overtime exceeding the quota uh, has to be compensated in rest, and this is mandatory. And this compensation comes in addition to paid overtime. So, overtime quota is 
counted over the year and not over the week, okay? So this overtime quota is calculated over the, the year um, and it only takes into account overtime that has not already been compensated in rest or in leaves or um, overtime due to urgent work. So overtime exceeding quota are compensated depending on the company's headcount. So if your company's uh, headcount is at most uh, 20 employees, the compensation for overtime performed uh, in excess of the quota will be 50%. So if you have an employee who um, has worked more than, uh, for example, 220 hours overtime over the year and perform, for example, 221 uh, over time over the year, well, the, this uh, one hour of a time will be compensated uh, first in payment, as we saw previously. So you'll pay your this overtime hour uh, with the increase of 25% uh, or 50%, depending of the situation. And in addition to that, you'll have to compensate it in rest um, at the rate of 50%. So it will be 30 minutes of compensation in rest that will come in addition to um, the compensation in salary. If your company's headcount is over 20 employees, <coughs> then the compensation in rest will be uh, of one, uh, 100%. So one hour of overtime will be compensated by one hour of rest. So now uh, considering night work, so this notion is uh, subject to two conditions. First, you need to have a working period of at least nine consecutive hours. And this working period needs to be between midnight and 5 a.m. Um, this period can start at the earliest at uh, 9 p.m. and has to end no later than 7 a.m. This uh, use of night work should be exceptional uh, and justified by the continuity of economic activities and the continuity of uh, social utility. So a collective agreement uh, shall determine the modalities for compensation. The law does not provide any information regarding uh, this uh, modalities. So you need to look up in your CBA, which we did for you. And uh, we have uh, an overview of these modalities. So you can have in rest or in compensation of salary. Um, there's a difference between uh, if the night work is exceptional or usual. Um, so, for instance, in the Santec uh, CBA, when it is uh, usual, the working period is from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m., whereas when it's exceptional, it's from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. So there's an hour of difference. Also, still in the Santec uh, CBA, there's a difference, for example, uh, with the wage increase. So if the night work is usual, we have a 25% of wage increase, whereas if the night work is exceptional, we have a 50% of wage increase. Uh, now, considering the notion of Sunday work, so as uh, Charlotte uh, explained in the beginning of the presentation, in France, we, you can work maximum six days over, uh, well, per week, which means the seventh day of the week has to be a rest day and it's provided, uh, well, usually on Sundays, but uh, there are some exceptions to this um, rest period. 
um, which depends on the sector of activity. So for example, in food retails on Sunday morning, or um, if the mayor uh, decides in some retails uh, that there will be a derogation on this Sunday rest. There is also exception on, well, considering the geographical basis. So for instance, all international touristic areas, um, shopping areas, uh, railway stations also. Uh, there's also the exception depending on the modalities of work. This means if the collective agreement establish, for instance, shift work or continuous work. And also, uh, you can, well, make your employee work on Sundays if there is a public need or uh, for the normal, normal functioning of uh, establishment. So <clears throat> there are certain conditions to be met to implement these exceptions. Um, all of the exceptions, uh, you will need the employee agreement. So whether it's in food retails on geographical basis or shift work or continuous work, you'll always, always need the employee's agreement. There are other conditions that are specific to the exception. Uh, for instance, on a geographical basis, uh, you will need uh, to have your area uh, mentioned in the ministerial decree. Uh, for instance, a lot of uh, areas in Paris are in this uh, ministerial decree, so they can open, well, retails can open uh, on Sundays. Um, and also, uh, for instance, in the industries with shift work or continuous work, you'll need a collective agreement that establish this shift work or continuous work prior to any uh, possible work on Sunday. Uh, also, the, remuner the salary, the compensation uh, is provided by, lo by law, but Mostibre provides uh, other compensation. We established an inventory of uh, these compensation, whether this time also if the work is exceptional or usual. Um, so there are differences here also, for instance, in the Santec, you can have only 15 exceptions to this resting period. Uh, and in World, World Sales Trade CBA, there are, for instance, only three exceptions per year per employee for uh, such a rest period. Um, considering the usual Sunday work, some CBA do not provide any possibility to do so. This is the case for the pharmacy industry and the metallurgy. Yeah, all of those mandatory rules um, can also apply or not apply depending on the type of contract or the type of employees. So uh, as you can see in that table, um, there are, well, we listed employees uh, who depends on legal work duration and some other employees who are excluded from legal work duration. So first, employees under legal work duration, which is um, 35 hours per week, are employees working under open-ended contracts, fixed-term contracts, part-time contracts, home-based workers, temporary workers, apprentices, employees subject to an wholly flat rate pay arrangement. Um, then you have employees excluded from legal work duration. There are top executives, employees subject to a daily flat rate pay agreement, except for the provisions on resting period, which are applicable to them, but Roxanne is going to tell you more on that point later on. Uh, traveling salesmen and domestic workers. So to sum things up on that presentation, you have to keep in mind that there is a mandatory 
a legal work duration in France that applies, which is 35 hours per week per employee. And you have to combine that work duration with the possibility of performing overtime that is first calculated over the week. It means that every hour exceeding 35 hours per week is considered as overtime. <coughs> but also over the year, meaning that if the um, all of overtime performed per, by employees um, goes over um, the sailing of 220 hours per year or another sailing uh, set up by your company a collective agreement or the company uh, collective bargaining agreement uh, it will be also considered as over time but with uh, additional rules you'll have to apply also you have to combine all this information we know that's a lot with the mandatory um, maximum work duration we saw previously and uh, the resting time periods Then now, Roxane is going to explain you what we mean in France by working time. And you'll see there are different uh, notions. So uh, working time is a particular concept uh, in French labor law, which is subject to three cumulative conditions. First of all, you need uh, your employee to be at the disposal of the employer. So the only fact that the employee is on the premises uh, does not mean that he is at your disposal. Uh, you need to determine whether the employees are released from uh, professional or personal activity. The second condition it is that um, the employee has to comply with the employer's order. This means that uh, he needs to carry out uh, the work on the employer's request, whether this request is uh, explicit or implicit. The third condition is that the employee cannot go freely about his personal business. So this means, well, there's an example, uh, for instance, when an employee is on a business travel, if he can uh, go about his personal business, uh, this is not considered as working time. This notion of working time is a public policy provision, so uh, you cannot derogate it. There are some times that are excluded from this notion, and I will present you all of these time. So for big, well, first time is the break time and lunch time. So break time is any short time stoppage of work at or near the workplace. Uh, this time is not considered as working time. It is not paid as working time unless your CBA, your collective bargaining agreement, uh, provides otherwise. And uh, very important, this so short time stoppage is not defined by the duration of uh, the stoppage. It can be three minutes, 20 minutes, an hour long. It does not matter. There are uh, some exceptions in which uh, break time and lunch time are considered as working time. Uh, it's when an employee has to eat at his workplace without any freedom of movement during his time. So we have an example, uh, for instance, a cook that needs to stay in his kitchen and that cannot go freely about his personal occupation and has to eat uh, at his workplace, he, this time, is considered as working time and has to be paid as such. Uh, other time excluded from working time is dressing and undressing time. So, um, as your collective agreement, branch agreement, or the employment contract can provide that this specific time is uh, a working time. And there are also exceptions uh, in, well, considered by law uh, as working time. It's if 
the employee has to wear uh, clothes that this is mandatory and if the dressing and undressing must take place in the company or at the workplace so if for instance the employee has to can come to work already dressed then this is not considered as working time um, well i can tell you an example of when it's considered as working time it's for instance in a lab if uh, the lab uh, employee has to uh, wear a special uh, dressing because of the sanitized area then since it's mandatory and it must take place at the work, then it will be considered as working time. Um, other time excluded from this notion, it's on call duty. So it's what is on call duty? It's when the employee is not at his workplace, it's he's not permanently or immediately available, and he must be able to intervene to perform work the basic uh, idea of uh, on-call workers are, for example, firefighters and medical uh, urgents. Um, so this is not considered as working time, but the period of intervention is considered as working time. So while you're at home or at your personal space, you are not uh, on working time. Uh, to implement on-call duty, you must have a company agreement a bench agreement or uh, the employer has uh, has to uh, implement this after receiving the opinion of the CSE and after informing the labor inspectorate. <clears throat> after this we also have travel time from home place and from workplace so first of all from home place to workplace this is not considered as working time except when uh, an employee on, on call duty uh, comes from his own place to his workplace, this time of travel is considered as working time. So also if you have uh, usual travel from home place to workplace, there is no compensation needed. But if you travel uh, from your home place to an unusual workplace, uh, then you need to have a compensation in form of rest or money. So for instance, if you need to go to a client that leaves uh, uh, 30 minutes from your workplace, then this extra time will be compensated in the form of rest or money. Uh, regarding the travel time between two workplaces, it is considered as working time and has to be paid as such. So, for instance, between two agency, between warehouse company and the site of construction. However, if the employee does not need to go to the warehouse before going to the site of construction, but still does this, then this time will not be considered as working time. Um, so, I hope this notion, which is kind of pretty complicated, was uh, clear for you. And now I'm going to let Charlotte uh, introduce the third chapter on working time flight rate pay arrangement. Well, thank you very much, Roxanne. Uh, we do know that some of you um, uh, have already experienced uh, lump sum work duration. And uh, here we consider that it was the occasion to represent you how it works in France, what are the different lump sum work duration uh, you can set up. Um, so you have to, uh, to keep in mind that there are different flat rate pay arrangements. So what are they? They are in hours or in days. Um, I'm going to start with, with flat rate arrangements in hours. So to do so, you need a written agreement between the employer and the employee. Uh, this agreement will set out an overall number of hours to be worked during a given period of time, which includes permanent and fixed overtime. Then you can set up flat rate pay arrangement in days this time um, and this is when it's impossible to determine a number of hours 
worked by the employee because of his function. Um, this is the case for what we call day contract, forfait jour, which, has, which are very specific. And Roxanne will explain to you uh, later uh, how it works. Uh, so you have two different types of uh, flat rate pay arrangements. First, you have flat rate arrangement in hours or in days. Regarding arrangement in hours, you can have it on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, or on a yearly basis. Whereas day contracts are only uh, in days. And uh, Roxanne will explain that to you later on. So what are what we call forfait heure? Um, so that type of lump sum work arrangement um, can, uh, can be made on se several uh, time bases. We'll start with weekly and monthly bases. So you have to meet three conditions. First, a written agreement between the parties. So most of the time it will be a clause in the contract or an amendment to an existing contract. In that agreement, you'll have to indicate a global volume of hours to be worked during the period, um, and the salary should be at least equal to the minimum salary applicable within the company with regard to the employee's position, and it will, it will have to include the increase in salary for overtime or the compensation in overtime. Um, actually, you have to keep in mind that uh, that kind of uh, working time arrangement cannot uh, be an occasion to uh, indicate a lump sum uh, salary uh, that would lead the employee to get um, an inferior salary than the one he would get if he would work under a normal work duration. Um, okay, and the risk if uh, if you don't meet those conditions and if um, this work working time arrangement is not compliant is that the employee will be able to invoke the nullity of the arrangement and claim back for over overtime and ask you for uh, for the payment uh, of that overtime Regarding that kind of work arrangement, uh, unlike day contracts uh, we'll see later on, every employee is eligible to that type of uh, weekly or monthly forfeit in hours. There is no need to have a company agreement to implement such forfeit. As I told you uh, just before, you, you can have only an arrangement, well, an agreement between the employee and the, the employer. This is enough. So how does it work? So overtime is included in the forfeit and it must be worked in, in accordance with the contractual terms. And overtime exceeding the forfeit must be paid on an increased basis. If the employee works less than expected, the salary must remain the same. <coughs> also, you have the obligation to count the working time actually accomplished. So you'll see, and uh, this will be true also for day contracts, um, every time you have this notion of a lump sum working time arrangement, um, the employer and also the employee have the obligation to have, uh, well, to set up a follow-up of the working time. Then you have this specific working time arrangement in hours, but on a yearly basis this time. Uh, this type of forfeit aims at including a determined volume of overtime over the year, and this will be among usual work duration. So to do so, you need to, uh, met, to meet two conditions. First, uh, the company's CBA must allow to do so, or if not, you can negotiate a company agreement on that topic. In addition to that, you need to sign a written agreement with the employee. 
Um, we gave you just uh, below some examples of uh, collective bargaining agreements that allow or not that type of uh, lump sum per work arrangement in hours on a yearly basis. So, regarding forfeit in hours on a yearly basis, who is likely to be concerned? <coughs> so, we, we saw previously for forfeit in hours on a monthly uh, or weekly basis that any employees can be uh, concerned by that type of arrangement. Well, for forfeit in hours on a yearly basis, it's quite different. Um, it will concern only executives whose duties do not require them to work um, regarding collective hours. And it can also concern employees who have a real autonomy in organizing their working time. And how does it work? Then the employees does not have uh, the right to freely determine his working hours. He has to perform the number of hours uh, that is indicated uh, in the agreement. And the employees are subject to the provision on the maximum work duration and resting period. This is why you also have to, um, to do a specific follow-up uh, to be able to check that uh, this mandatory regulation um, is respected. Uh, the maximum work duration and resting period is the same as the ones we saw at the very beginning of the presentation. And uh, in that situation, employees are not subject to uh, the overtime quota. Um, exceeding that forfeit. So, employees can exceed the volume of hours provided for in the agreement. In that situation, uh, hours exceeding the forfeit within the limit of 1,607 hours are paid as any other working hours. But hours exceeding that sailing as are paid as overtime. It's also important to keep in mind that the Solidarity Day, we call Journée de Solidarité, also applies to employees subject to a fixed annual number of hours. <coughs> so in that table you have a sum up of all the forfeit in hours over a weekly or monthly basis and yearly basis. <coughs> Excuse me. And you have um, um, well kind of a sum up of the conditions um, for all that type of uh, working time arrangement. <laughs> then I hand over to Roxanne, who is going to talk to you about four phase in days, which are very common. So regarding four phase in days, uh, not all employees are eligible to these four phase. Uh, the employees that are eligible are, first of all, executive who have autonomy in the organization of their time and whose duty does not require them to follow the collective timetable. So the criterion of autonomy does not depend on the job title but really on the responsibilities, on the travels, etc. Uh, other Employees eligible are the employees whose working hours cannot be predetermined and who have genuine autonomy in organizing their time, uh, their working hours to carry out their responsibilities. The top executives are excluded from uh, this forfeit as they are not subject to working time legislation. <laughs> so forfeit in days uh, need to be, well, to put to carry on these forfeits, you need two conditions. First of all, you need your collective bargaining agreement or a company agreement to uh, allow it. So in collective agreement, we can find the mention of uh, the category of employee who, are, who may conclude such agreement. We can find the period of reference, uh, 
this means uh, is it yearly is it on 12 consecutive months um, you can also find the number of days included in such forfait um, and how to follow up this forfait which is very important and we will see that later the second condition is that you need an written agreement between the employee and the employer. Uh, this is uh, very important and without such agreement, there is no uh, forfait in forfait jour. Um, so this forfait is uh, very complicated because if you don't respect this a lot, if you don't respect the conditions, the sanctions can be heavy. Uh, for instance, you will have to pay overtime for uh, the time truly worked. And if you have implemented this for a lot of, well, a consecutive number of years, this uh, payment can be very, very high. Uh, also, you can be entitled to, uh, well, the employee can be entitled to claim compensation for undeclared work because he will work overtime and this will not be declared. <clears throat> so why do we use forfeits in days? These forfeits are used to uh, pay on the basis of number of days worked per annum. This means that you don't have to count overtime. So it's for employees who have very uh, Autonomous, autonomous uh, working time. These uh, employees benefit from all minimum rest provisions, so the daily rest provision of 11 hours and the weekly rest provision of 24 hours. They also benefit from bank holidays and from paid leave. However, they are excluded from, well, the legal work duration because we don't count in hours, but in days. They are also excluded uh, of overtime, of course, and of the maximum daily work duration, maximum weekly work duration, and the notion of working hours. So to sum up any notion of hours, they are excluded from, except uh, the daily rest and the weekly rest. So in the forfeit days, we have what we call additional rest days. So how does it work? We have an example of uh, how it works for 2023. So in a forfeit days, that is uh, two, 218 sorry, days. Uh, in the year, we have 365 days. We have 52 Sundays that are not counted uh, in the forfeit. We have 52 Saturdays that are also excluded from the forfeit. 25 days of paid leave. And uh, in the year of 2023, we have nine public holidays that uh, fall on a weekday. So by uh, all of these uh, days, when you well, you have a rest of nine days, uh, and these days are additional rest days. We, well, we use the term RTT, which is a misuse of language because uh, actually RTT is from the Aubry law, which uh, Charlotte explained in the very beginning of this presentation. So the Aubry law um, installed uh, 35 hours of week whereas before it was 39 hours. And so for companies that wanted their, their employee to remain on the 39 hours of week, you could uh, install RTT in order to uh, respect the legal provision of 35 hours and to pay them at a standard rate. So we really misuse the word RTT in this forfeit days because they are additional rest days that are uh, Oh, that change uh, yearly and that are mandatory. Even if, well, as I will explain right now, it is possible to give up those RTT, but it has to be, first of all, upon the request of the employee and accepted by the employer. 
So you cannot ask your employee to give up those RTT. Uh, it, there needs to be a written agreement between the two parties. You need to increase the salary uh, of those days by a 10% uh, increase, well, at least. And you need, uh, well, you can't go over the 235 days maximum. Um, if you have remains of RTT at the end of your day, of your year, sorry, uh, two, three possible things can uh, happen. First, you can uh, create an amendment to change the number of days in the forfait jour. However, uh, this must be done before the, the end of the year. So uh, this is why you need to follow up your employees in forfait jour. Also, you can carry over the RTT, even though it is not uh, so great. You can sometimes carry over the first two months of the following year, but your employee really, really needs to take this RTT. And uh, it is possible to add the RTT to the time saving account. Uh, so we have an overview of the provision of the CBA, which you can see in your uh, in the support. Uh, considering the CBA, there. No, sorry. I will summarize the forfait in jour. So the reference period uh, is civil year or 12 consecutive months. Uh, as you saw the conditions, so you need a written agreement, you need a CBA uh, or a company agreement, and you need an uh, autom autonomous executive. So the work duration is uh, more or less of 218 days. You can reduce this forfait in days, but not in hours. So this is not a part-time contract. For instance, you can have an employee on 200 days and not 218, but he will still work uh, full, -time. full time, exactly. Um, so I explained to you all about the additional uh, um, rest days, so I will not talk about this anymore. And about the follow-up, so this is very, very important and you need to control and monitor and check regularly how your employee is doing, if he's respecting his right of disconnection, if he's uh, taking his RTT. Uh, well, yes, that's very important. So now Roxanne is going to, uh, to explain you how part-time contracts uh, work. Uh, very quickly yeah. so so we, we part-time contracts are every contracts under the 35 hours per week any employee can work on a time part basis uh, it has to be on the employees or at the employer's request it's always written because uh, if not it's considered as full-time uh, part-time can be arranged on a weekly or a monthly basis and the minimum duration of part-time contracts are 24 hours per week. Uh, so complementary hours is basically a sort of uh, um, overtime, but for uh, uh, part-time contracts. So it's all hours uh, realized over the contractual work duration. It's complementary hours. These hours cannot be over one tenth of the contractual work uh, duration, or one third if your collective agreement or collective bargaining agreement provides so. Uh, you are entitled if you uh, in, if you go beyond this maximum, you are entitled to a 25%. Well, your employee are entitled, sorry, to a 25% increase of wage and a re-evaluation of this uh, part-time contract is possible. So we have a quick uh, uh, summarize of your CBA, which you will be able to see on the support that we will send you uh, very soon.
just for last thing about the part-time contract is that complementary hours are paid uh, with an increase of wage so all times between uh, all time exceeding the contractual hours within the limit of one tenth uh, one tenth of working time is paid a 10 percent increase and there is a 25 percent increase for each hour completed beyond the one tenth and up to one third limit thank you very much roxanne um so we we talked to you about work duration and uh, there's also an, another topic relating to that subject. It's how do you monitor work duration? Um, <coughs> so regarding uh, how to monitor work duration in hours. Well, you have to uh, consider if you have a collective working time or an individual working time. So collective working time is when all of your employees or all of the employees of a department or in the same team work under the same schedule. Individual working time is when employees in a department or in a, or in a team do not work under the same time schedule. So um, regarding collective working time, you have an obligation to post or display the hours to which each period of work begins and ends, so the beginning of the day, the end of the day, um, the hours and duration of rests. Regarding individual uh, working time, so an individual count of working hours must be made by any means on a daily and a weekly basis. So each day, for example, by recording the start and end time of each work period and by recording the number of hours worked and each week by summarizing the number of hours worked by each employee. Regarding collective working time, um, please note that um, the document uh, that you posted or displayed has to be signed by the employer and sent to the work inspectorate. Regarding forfeiting days, to avoid, well, this part is very important for four day contracts because to avoid abuses, the employer has to regularly ensure that the employee's workload is reasonable. And to do so, the employee has to have uh, at least one or several interviews with the employee all over the year. Um, and during this, um, the, those interviews, you have to discuss the employee's workload, the work organization, the link between work and private life, and the employee's salary. You also have to, um, to set up monitoring documents, um, which allow to indicate the number and dates of day, half day that are worked or rests, um, position and type of rest day, uh, are there RTT days, are there paid lift day, etc. Um, you also have to uh, abide by the right to disconnect. Um, this is also very important uh, for day contracts. So here you have an example of a document um, to help you with the follow-up of day contracts. So you'll have this in the document. And now we'll just uh, talk very, very quickly <coughs> about work duration uh, for employees who are under a mobility situation. Well, actually, as said uh, Roxanne at the very beginning of the, of the presentation, uh, work duration is mandatory. Well, rules uh, about work duration in France are uh, mandatory. And uh, as such, they apply to any, well, to every person who works in France and also to um, seconded workers or, or foreign workers working in France remotely. So uh, the mandatory rules will be uh, regarding work duration, compensatory rest, bank holidays, paid leaves, young workers' work duration, night work. All of those uh, rules have to be abided uh, by when you send 
an employee in France to work, even if it's second month or remote work uh, from France. <coughs> well, thank you very much for your intention. We hope that you enjoyed uh, our presentation. Um, we hope it was clear for every one of you. Um, I'm just going to check if we have some questions because we have just a few minutes uh, left. Um, okay, so there's no questions, so I hope we were uh, clear enough for you. Um, anyway, if you have any additional question regarding this presentation, uh, don't hesitate contacting us. We'll be very happy to uh, answer you. And uh, of course, you'll receive our presentation uh, by email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.